Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Rogers, a children's librarian who podcasts with and for kids on a podcast called Buttons and Figs. And I'm a new proud member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit your questions via the questions box in the control panel. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Patricia Jimenez will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the questions box. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number and access code provided in your registration confirmation email and in the notes. When you exit this session, you will be directed to a simple three question evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use this data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. The Arizona Library Association wishes to acknowledge the native nations that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations on whose ancestral homelands and resources AZLA member libraries were built. My apologies. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Arizona Library Association members accountable to the information needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. I'd like to encourage library staff at all levels to, to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. Speaking of the monthly webinar series, the Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. Go to the link that is listed on the slide to submit your idea. You can also find a link in your Professional Development Monthly Newsletter. Today's webinar is sponsored by Literacy Connects. Literacy Connects is the premier literacy hub in Southern Arizona, providing transformational learning through joyous student-centered relationships and a strength-based approach. They serve learners across five programs, English language acquisition for adults, adult basic literacy, reading seed, stories that soar, and reach out and read Southern Arizona. Their commitment to access and equity drives them to connect individuals across the community to work together for long-term social impact. They firmly believe that everyone deserves access to literacy and learning, and their classes are open to all, regardless of background or immigration status. Tapping into the wellspring of children's imagination, Literacy connects stories that soar, programs transform, and share students' words and ideas through the arts to inspire creativity, promote active literacy, and build engaged communities. When children realize their words and ideas have meaning and power beyond themselves, they seize the opportunity to engage in our collaborative process of bringing original stories to life. Any student can now submit their original work to their Magic Box Story Portal. We encourage everyone to visit Literacy Connects to learn more. I'd also like to announce the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by AZLA Professional Development Committee. February 11th, 2021, John Chaska 
executive director of Every Library, will discuss how austerity budgets work and what new advocacy techniques and skills you need to support your next budget request. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development newsletter, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. We would love to uh, just thank you for taking the time to join us today. And without further ado, I will pass presenter privileges to Kendra Davey for her presentation, From In-Person to Online, Considerations and Consternations. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess I really like this necklace. Just kind of funny, I forgot that I had that in my picture. <laughs> um, I'm really glad that you could join us today and are taking some time out of your day to um, for a little bit of professional development. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is moving from in-person to online programming. So, uh, you know, since we all love alliteration, considerations and consternations. So what um, I'm specific. I'm going to use one of the programs that we transitioned at Pima County Public Library from in-person program to online program in this last year. So I'm not really going to talk so much about the nuts and bolts of that specific program. I'm using that program as an example of ways in which you can transform your programming. Um, so the considerations we're going to talk about today are um, identifying the why of your program, building on the strengths of your organization, your staff, the program itself, um, and your community, um, really understanding your audience. And then some of those consternations um, are identifying obstacles and planning for the future. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is letting go of perfection. Um, so hopefully um, we have a good experience today. Otherwise, we'll just really focus on that last one, letting go of perfection. So um, what uh, the program that we're going to use, um, I'm going to use today for that example, is our Ready, Set, School program. Um, so this started as an in-person program, um, something that we've been developing for a, a couple of years. We've developed it um, based on research and the examples of other libraries in Arizona who have started school-ready programs, and I should say that this is a school-ready program for um, four- and five-year-olds. So that was something we already had in the works. We, we had just um, started it at a couple of libraries, and um, so that's what I'm using today um, as our example. So. A little bit of context for Ready, Set, School. As I said, it's a school-ready program. It is intended for the intended audience is four and five-year-olds and their caregivers. Um, and the idea of this program is to help kids get ready to start school learning successfully. So our program is in the in-person program is an eight-week program. It runs for an hour and a half. Um, the way the program is uh, organized, it's about three, it is three half an hour segments. Um, the first segment of that program is a circle time activity where we do um, alphabet and uh, letters and numbers and um, really help kids kind of experience what like a circle time would um, feel like it when they go to school. And um, then the next half an hour is looks more like a traditional library story time with songs um, and books and reading a story. And then the last half an hour of the program is a hands-on interactive activity that the caregiver and the child participate in together. All throughout the program, there's a lot of messaging for the caregiver of the child about um, executive function skills, learning, um, and ideas of how the caregiver is going to help their child get ready to be a successful learner once they start school. So the content is really for the four and five year olds, but it's really about family engagement. Um, we have 15 families um, max 
So we want to have a smaller group um, for that session. The, there is a set curriculum, and our curriculum um, is, I've got to give a shout out to Chandler Library, who really helped us with our curriculum. Um, so we were able to develop ours based on the experience that they had and the resources that they were using. And then we also used the book Mind in the Making um, by Ellen Galinsky as um, the basis for our program. So each week we focus on a different executive function skill. and um, we give the caregivers messages about how developing and practicing those executive function skills are going to help get their child ready to be a successful learner in kindergarten, but also throughout their whole lives. Um, and then those interactive activities that come at the end are all um, uh, examples of ways in which they can develop um, their academic skills, but as well as their executive function skills. And then each week we um, give them a uh, giveaway. Um, we give them a book every week. Um, and then we also every week provide a community resource um, that will help in their, you know, that may help the family be successful. Um, whether it's information about the counties, um, the health departments, um, vaccination clinics for starting school, or um, uh, neighborhood organizations or information about uh, the school kindergarten roundup that, that might be in their uh, school district. It, it, it kind of depends on what resource we focus on based on um, where the library is and what the community needs are. So that's our in-person program. We had, it was pretty successful. We were um, had good attendance. Um, we started at um, five libraries, and we were just thinking about expanding it um, to more libraries when the pandemic started. So, um, and, and you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, in PM County, like everywhere else, we kind of paused for a bit and then had to really rethink what we were going to do. So, um, this is the background of the program that um, we decided to transfer to from in-person to virtual. So as we're thinking about this transition, I'm gonna start with the why. And the answer to why start with why is actually really, really important. So actually before you start any program, you really need to understand why you're doing that program. Um, this sounds really obvious, and I know we talk about it a lot, and I'm sure you've all heard of this, you know, heard this before in presentations and workshops and um, in um, a strategic planning process. All of this, we start with that why, thinking about your own personal life. Um, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, but it's really very fundamental um, to having successful programs is to understand why you are doing what you are doing. If you understand why you are doing what you're doing, it gives you the ability um, to be flexible and um, to really understand your, how you can do what you're going to do. Um, so it really provides clarity. And then the other thing, and actually as I was listening to the um, introduction, thinking about the presentation that's coming next, how to um, advocate for yourself in an austere budget time it gives you the ability to advocate for yourself because you really understand why you're doing what you're doing um, and you can deliver a clear message so in the case of ready set school since um, we had done a lot of prep work before developing this program we really understood why we were doing this school ready program. And it boils down to this one sentence that comes from um, the Reimagining School Readiness Toolkit that children who start behind stay behind and gaps in education grow over time. That is a pretty succinct message. And if um, when I'm questioned about this program, um, either to ask for a justification or just asked about the program, I'm able to use that message as why this is so important. 
So we know that children need the educational skills um, and executive function skills when they start school in order to be successful in school. Um, but then we also dug into the um, stats in our um, county. So in, and, and this is from 2018. Um, and so, you know, the landscape has changed, but it's not changed for the better. Um, so in 2018, approximately 80% of four-year-olds in Pima County did not attend a high quality preschool either because there isn't a high quality preschool in their area because we do not have enough capacity of high quality um, early education programs um, or because it's um, not financially attainable for um, families so that's a lot of kids a lot of kids who are not starting prepared now also in our um, reading we know that you don't have to be in preschool in order to get the skills you need to be successful in starting kindergarten but you do need to have some way of getting those skills so caregivers can get those skills for their um their children but they need to know what they are and they need to know effective ways of supporting that skill building um, in their young children so thinking about that we also were thinking that school readiness is a natural extension of our already existing early education programs offered in the library. So um, like many of you, we've got our story times um, and uh, we've got baby time, toddler time, preschool story time. So we already have this you know, scaffolded early education programs, thinking about um, early literacy. So adding a specific school ready program is a really natural next step particularly once we know how important it is for those kids to get specific school ready skills in order to be successful in kindergarten. So our why was very clear and very um, easily articulated when we started this program, um, when we started the in-person program. Um, and so having that why was really important when we thought about what we were going to do in order to support our families in the transition from um, in-person to virtual, when our families can't come into the library anymore because it wasn't safe to come together um, and gather in person, how were we going to support them virtually in order to keep them safe, but also to continue to get them the skills that they need to be successful? So um, our, our why was very clearly articulated. And the other thing that that why helped us really think about was it allowed us to very intentionally build on the strengths that we have um, in our organization. Um, and that's the other thing that you wanna do when you're thinking about how you're gonna transition your programs or um, you know, if you've already figured out what um, virtual programs you wanna do, because we've been doing that for the last um, nine months, it may help you prioritize the programs that you need to continue to do if staffing shortages are something you're facing or budget cuts are something your um, library is facing if you understand the why it helps you prioritize and then you're also able to build on the strengths that you already have which is going to of course make that transition easier so you really want to think what is unique to your program what relationships already exist and this may be with community partners it may um, be with other governmental organizations, uh, it may be volunteers, uh, whatever it is, what, what is already in place that you have. Who already has the skills to support this program? Um, and that is really big. Um, that's a big question for when we're all learning something new. Does somebody already know how to do that thing? And then what infrastructure do you already have in place? So thinking about Ready, Set, School, um, what was our unique to our program was the relationship that our libraries have with our community. And not that that's unique to only Pima County Public Library, but that's definitely something that's unique um, for us in, um, to, when I would think about virtual programs. So at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody's transitioning to online um, and there were a lot of people reading books and doing online story times um, and so i was 
as we were trying to figure out how were we going to um, support programs, and especially in a time when um, many of our staff were staying home, we have very limited staff availability, I was thinking about what is the best use of our time. So understanding the extreme need for its school readiness, also looking at the world out there and knowing that our families, if they have access to the internet, they have access to all of the different online programs that people were doing around the country. So they could look at um, a New York Public Library story time because that's available on the internet. And they were doing some amazing stuff. So there's some libraries out there that already had these really great um, online programs. And we were behind that. Well, we weren't already doing that. We were focused on in-person, like probably most of you. So we didn't already have that in place. Um, and so I really thinking about what was the priority, I thought that um, providing Ready, Set, School was something that was really going to, to need to happen. Um, and we already had um, a curriculum developed. Um, we already had all of the um, kind of the infrastructure in place in order to make that transition easier. Um, one of the things that we already had was um, social media training and our county had already kind of figured out how to, how to deal with social media. So we had a lot of those accounts already in place, um, that training already in place. We had some basic equipment um, already, um, not a lot, but all, some. Um, I was very fortunate to have a, a colleague, Lisa Bunker, who's really focused on um, social media um, support with libraries. And she really understands the social media landscape. And so I was able to draw on her skill in order to make this program successful. So we already had some things in place to make this program easy. And then understanding the why helped me um, make the decision of why this program needed to happen in our community um, instead of uh, maybe starting a, um, a online story time. So that's why we decided to focus on Ready, Set, School because the why was clearly articulated, the need was clearly understood, and we already had a lot of support in place to do this. Um, we also had already trained staff um, who were able to um, they didn't have to be trained to do the program. They just needed to learn some of the um, technical skills they needed to do, do in order to run this program online. So we were able to really build on our strengths, um, which made it easier, but not easy, because there was a lot to learn. Um, there was a lot to do, and uh, we kept learning as we were going. So the other thing that's really important is to understand your audience. Um, and the um, for our ready set school, it's mo you know mostly parents of um, young children um, or caregivers, and um, that's who the audience is. Not necessarily the children themselves, um, and so which the content is for the children, but the messaging is for the adults. So the audience is really the adult, and we really have to get that adult person on board in order to get them to come into the library, or in this case, get them to come online um, and interact with their child. And so we needed to be clear about who that audience is and how this program meets their needs. Um, because there's a lot of ways out there that parents could get their kid ready for school. Um, we need to be clear about how this program um, supports them in their goals. The other thing that is really important that you need to understand, and I would say, generally speaking, in library land, we are not good about this, is thinking about what is the behavior that you are not going to change. Oftentimes, we come up with an idea. We, we see a need. We come up with an idea. We've got a lot of programming experience, and so we're going to you know, develop this program. But we don't really take into account the behavior of those our, the, the audience that we cannot change. Um, we're not going to convince them. Um, uh, I get teen programs are a good example, right? Um, you're probably not going to have a super successful teen program if you started at seven in the morning. I don't actually know very many adults who want to start programs at seven in the morning, but that's just a good example, right? Very easy. You probably don't want to 
do a teen program. We're not going to change that audience, that teen audience, that teen behavior of uh, waking up early, uh, you know, generally speaking. Um, and then also really understanding what the challenges our audience is facing. So this, um, this question um, came into play when we're talking about starting Ready, Set, School, and we're trying to figure out, should we do it as a Zoom um, program? Um, should we record it and put it on YouTube? Should we, you know, how are we going to do this virtual program? And that, so understanding our audience, understanding the program itself, understanding the why of the program led us to decide to present this using Facebook Live. Um, and that was a pretty intentional decision um, because we know that a lot of parents already use Facebook. They already have a Facebook account, so they wouldn't have to um, go somewhere new. We also have um, pretty high engagement on our Facebook um, program, our Facebook accounts for our library system, but also our branch system. So that would be a good way to reach people um, when we're not able to promote it through them coming into the library. Um, so we understood the audience and we understand their behavior. And then thinking about what challenges they're facing, um, we know that there's, they were, everybody was transitioning to online, right? Which means that um, some of our families didn't have access or um, they might have school age children that they're trying to figure out how to do online schooling with, um, as well as their um, young child, preschool age child. So there's a lot of challenges that they're facing. And so the ability that, are the um, one of the aspects of Facebook Live is then we were able to have that recording of the program um, so that it gave us the ability to kind of combine a Zoom type um, program where the families can watch it but interact through the comments. So it's still interactive and we can um, have some sort of live interaction with the, the um, um, families who are watching, um, but also it gives the, us the ability for them to watch it later um, if they have, like their, their, you know, maybe their third grader needs to be in class um, during Ready, Set, School, so they could watch it later with their preschooler. Um, so that allowed us to um, meet them where they are, you know, using that terminology, but also to um, overcome some of the challenges that they're facing. But in deciding to do it on Facebook Live, that did um, make some things a little harder because um, thinking about which I will talk about when we get into challenges. So that did also create some challenges um, that if we'd chosen a different um, online platform like Zoom, um, we would have had different challenges. And I just posted these. These are two pictures that came from the comments. Um, so um, during one of the sessions, our presenters showed pictures of themselves that they had drawn and they were putting them up as the audience, which is in the um, the room, not that you can see it when they're on camera, but they showed their picture and said, this is who we're presenting to, share your picture and we'll put them up um, so you can be in our virtual audience. And so these are two pictures that parents shared on Facebook um, of their kids. So you can see that we're getting that sort of that interaction, right, which allows us to continue with that um, relationship in a virtual way that we cannot right now um, do in person. All right, so moving on um, to identifying obstacles, um, especially in the virtual, um, moving, transitioning to virtual, there may be a lot of obstacles, um, things like equipment, do you have um, a video camera, do you have a, a, you know, fast enough internet to um, do live streaming of um, a program? Um, do, you, do you have staff who know how to do this? Do you have the time to figure out how to do it? Are there any outside barriers to doing this? Um, and is your audience able to access what you're doing? So those are just a few, I'm sure there's more. Um, and uh, this picture I just grabbed from the internet because I needed a picture of um, equipment. Um, but we did have a um, we did have some equipment. So we had um, a 
lighting kit and um, uh, iPad um, that we used. Um, and like I said, we did already have training. So Lisa was an amazing support at the beginning. Um, and we have all um, those of us who are working on the program have all completed social media training. So we kind of understand how to engage in that social media um, landscape professionally, um, not just um, personally. Um, we did have time, but um, that's one thing that has um, we did have to really think about is the time. Um, and the staff needed, um, because when we do this in person, you really only need one one presenter. But to do this online, you need two people. You need somebody who's doing the the presentation, the you know singing the songs, reading the books, engaging with audience, and then we have a second person who's running the comments, um, because it is almost impossible to present and read comments, and um, especially uh, with Facebook, but. Um, maybe other um, online platforms as well. There's a bit of a lag in between um, the person talking and the um, reactions from the uh, audience um, listening. So in Ready Set School, um, especially during the circle time at the beginning, we ask questions um, and we want the kids to answer. Um, and that's a really important way for them to develop their critical thinking skills and their communication skills. So um, we really want there to be a conversation um, in this time. So we pause, um, which feels super awkward, actually, because you're sitting in a room and presenting to the void. And so you kind of have to get used to that. Um, but then there's e e a little bit more of a, of a lag before you, when you ask a question, before you get the answer. And so having the um, second person running the comments um, really makes it possible. It would be very difficult, very awkward, and um, very stressful to do it on your own. Um, and that's something that we learned. So that's actually something that Lisa knew right from the beginning. Um, but then after that, um, we had to develop, as we moved on to adding other presenters, make sure that we had always two people, um, one to present and one to run the comments. Um, and so then that really impacts time, right? Do you have staff time to have now two people involved in a program? So are there any outside barriers? Um, in our case, since we already had a social media um, kind of presence set up, um, we didn't have, that was a barrier that could have stopped us um, because when we first started some of the social media things, and this was several years ago, um, it was new for our county and they had to put policies in place and trainings in place to make sure that everything, you know, um, works right for governmental regulations and things. So um, we had that in place, but some of those outside barriers may also be things like um, if you're doing a story time, are you are you meeting the publisher's um, agreements for um, rights? And so we have to make sure that um, whenever we read a book that we're following whatever um, permissions the publisher has given. Um, and um, so uh, really thinking about all of those, those things, because you could have, if you haven't thought about that ahead of time, you could have this really great program and then run into a problem because you haven't considered those um, outside barriers that might stop you. Um, and then audience access is, of course, a huge um, consideration for doing anything virtual. Um, again, that's one reason we chose to go with Facebook is because we knew we had a lot of audience members already um, using Facebook and feel comfortable with Facebook. So it's not one more thing they had to learn. Of course, now probably most families are super comfortable with Zoom, um, but this was at the beginning. Um, so. As we were um, really kind of transitioning this program to online, um, we were also thinking about what are the, um, how is the online different than in person? And so, as I said, the in person is an hour and a half, um, but when we're thinking about doing it online, we shortened everything. Because some of that um, time um, that we have is because you're physically getting up and moving around the room and you're dealing with um, 15 or more kids in the space. Um, so some of that just takes time. Um, and like the half an hour thing at the end, well, we're not gonna spend a half an hour 
for the interactive activity because they're not actually doing the activity. We're just demoing it because there's no kids in the room. So our um, we did keep the structure of the program basically the same, but since it's virtual, it is different than in person, and we shortened it. So now it's about 45 minutes, and we've not even quite that long. Um, and everything is um, three 15-minute sections, more or less. Um, but everything is is basically the same. And then a lot of the um, um, community resources, we share those in links. So we are making sure that they're um, there are resources that we can link to so people can you know find it online um, so um, some of those obstacles were identified um, ahead of time of course some you can't really identify until you start going so having that flexibility is really important and that's where if you really understand your why then it'll, it's going to allow you to make sure that you're keeping that why at the heart of what you do, um, regardless of how you change the program. Um, so we made sure that really the, the heart of that um, virtual program with the messaging to parents and really helping them um, figure out ways that they can support their child in developing executive function skills, all of that is really strongly um, in the online program um, as well. So then that that it's not that we have to do it exactly the same but we're able to really identify what is what is at the heart of this the core of this the center of the why um that we're keeping intact as we change the program all right um also you want to plan for the future so a lot of what we're doing is pivoting really quickly um you know or as quickly as um governmental institutions pivot but um you know, is this going to be a short-term thing? Um, so maybe we are just going to do this program. It's just uh, we're just doing it right now because we can't do it any other way. But we're not going to do it um, forever. But there may be um, this may be an opportunity for you to meet your um, community uh, members' needs in a new way that you weren't thinking of before. But now that you're really thinking about it, it might be a better fit. Um, so how are you going to um, do this long term? Is it sustainable? Um, and is this, uh, do you have a way of evaluating this? Um, so I put in just this example of our virtually virtual programming checklist. As we were developing Ready, Set, School, we were also developing um, all sorts of resources for doing um, different types of virtual programs um, and making sure that our staff have the um, resources um, in place in order to be successful with their virtual program planning and execution. Um, so this is just a piece of it. We have a whole bunch of resources and we even in, developed a virtual programming planner so that as people are planning their program right from the beginning, they're thinking about some of the um, different types of things they need to have in place for a virtual program as opposed to an in-person program. Um, and then making sure you have that evaluation in place so that you can make sure that um, what you're doing is indeed achieving the goal that you have for that program. All right, and then um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then I have left probably more time than I should have for questions, um, but um, I definitely want to uh, make sure I answer your questions. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is letting go of perfection. And again, this is something that we hear about all the time, but you have to really let go of being perfect. Um, and actually I have some really good reasons why, um, even if you happen to be a perfect person, um, you should pretend not to be. So um, one, you cannot and you should not do everything. Um, and this, I mean, in a couple of different ways. One, not every program that we do in person can be virtual and should be virtual. So we're not going to be able to transition everything to online. Um, it, uh, some things just don't work that way. Um, some things don't work that way effectively. And it uh, wouldn't meet um, our whole community's needs because not everyone has access to virtual programs, right? So it's not going to be everything. Um, 
you may not also be the one to do everything. Um, so maybe you're a great presenter in person, um, but you're just not comfortable in front of a camera. And so you're not the best person for that. Um, maybe there is someone else on your staff who is more comfortable being on camera. Um, and it is weird, it's weird to sit in front of a computer um, and present to a green dot on my screen. I don't really know who all you are out there. I don't know if anyone's watching this. You guys may have all tuned out for uh, as far as I know, and I could just be talking into the void. I don't know. And that can be really uncomfortable for people. I um, mean, not everyone um, likes that. So maybe you aren't the person to do it, um, but you're the person to support. So you can provide the information, you can provide the planning, but somebody else will present. But then also, you might need a partner. Like I said, we found out that you really have to have two people doing the um, program. One person to um, do the comments and is kind of behind the scenes, um, doing all the behind the, the scenes stuff, and the other person to present. It really does take a lot of energy to present to no one, um, just like it does take a lot of energy to present to a room full of people. Um, so you also want to be making sure that you have the energy um, to do virtual programs. Um, and of course, virtual programs are not the same as in person, so it's going to be different. One thing, when I started doing Ready, Set, School, and this is a picture of the first one that we did, and we did it in the children's room, um, which is great in person, but turns out not to be super great virtually because the lighting is not great, and there's a glare, and uh, it was hard to make sure I had everything in the um frame right which in in-person story time i never thought about what what's the frame um that i'm presenting in um but you have to think about that are you are you holding your book so that that um you can see um if you're using an ipad are you using the front facing camera or the rear facing camera because if you're using the front facing camera so that you can see what the frame is it's mirrored and your audience is going to see the words backwards, um, which isn't great for story time because I don't want kids to be seeing a mirror image of writing. So um, then we had to turn the mirroring off, which means every time you move, it's going to actually be opposite of what you see. So can you do that? Do you feel comfortable with that? Lots of stuff um, to think about, which means you're not going to be perfect um, and you're going to be learning as you go. Which brings me to the last point, um, that it is important to be transparent with your learning. Um, we in libraries are all about learning communities. Um, we're there to support our families in learning something. And especially when you're working with young children um, or children or teens, but also with adults, we're modeling that we are learning. And that's really powerful. So I'm showing kids that it's okay to not know something, to not know the answer, to, to, um, to, to, to make a mistake, to not be perfect because no one is perfect. Um, you may be really good at something but that, that um, comes with practice over time, right? And so if I'm showing that, that's a really powerful thing. Um, and it's also really great um, to be transparent with your learning, be transparent with your mistakes, because it also gives permission to the adults in those children's lives to not be perfect, because they are also not perfect. And it's a lot of pressure. You think that you have to be perfect. It's a lot of pressure on yourself to appear perfect. It's a lot of pressure on your audience. So let go of that pressure. It's okay. It's okay not to be perfect, because nobody is. And in fact, um, I do tell people who've done story time for a long time that you may get really good at it and you don't actually make mistakes anymore because you've practiced it and so you have to put some mistakes in there so you can say oh whoops i picked up the wrong book or oh i skipped a page or oh i just read that word wrong um whatever you're gonna show that it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to learn um that we're always learning new things learning can be uncomfortable and hard but it's okay it's not going to kill us um so it's important to let go of perfection and um it's actually pretty powerful for yourself and for your community so um that is pretty much it i found um i'll share these slides out um so you can have these um links there's a ton of information out there um and for doing 
Zoom with lighting and sound and where you should put your camera and how you should put your laptop or, you know, all of that stuff. There's a lot of information out there. Um, it can be hard to sort through and it really depends on what your goals are. Um, so I found one that's pretty basic, um, but this top one, the Zoom tips more than just lighting, I actually found this. Um, it's a puppeteer is talking about why um, doing something virtually like a Zoom meeting, why it's so exhausting and ways that you can using kind of puppeteering um, concepts, you can make it a little bit more engaging. Um, and that one was kind of fun. So I put that in there, something to think about. And or maybe you just decide to um, leave your library career behind to become a puppeteer. Um, more power to you. Um, so that one was fun. Um, and yeah, um, I'm also happy to um, share more information about Ready, Set, School. So if you came today thinking that you were going to hear how to do Ready, Set, School online and you didn't hear that today, um, I am happy to talk with you specifically about how you can add um, a school ready program into your lineup of programs. I'm happy to share the resources and even our full curriculum. Um, and you're welcome to um, use it, change it, um, throw it in the trash, whatever you want to do. Um, and then I'm also happy to help you think about maybe some of the ways you might want to be transitioning your programs um, from in person to virtual. Although, honestly, I have very limited experience with that. Um, but what I do have is a lot of experience about that program planning and really figuring out why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and that is still, I think, key um, to being successful. So, yeah, thanks. And um, hopefully Pam was um, gathering the questions and will share those with me, which I don't actually know how that happens. <laughs> I am Kendra. Thank you so much. That was incredibly valuable and uh, just gave us a lot to think about. Questions are coming in. I please encourage you to um, um, continue to send in those questions and I'll go ahead and read them to you and ask right. you to um, share your information. So we have a great question um, that I think everyone will want to know the answer to, and it is, do you have concerns that once we get back to quote unquote normal, that there will be an expectation to have in-person and virtual programming? And if so, would you have the resources to do both? That is a really good question. And we have been talking about that. And Yes, I think that there will be an expectation that some of these virtual programs continue. Um, whether that's an expectation you are obligated to meet or not is up to you. And that's why understanding the why of what you're doing is really helpful. Um, because then it gives you the ability to evaluate what you're doing and really make a decision based on um, data really because you can gather that so I do think that um, ready set school it will be really helpful um, for our community to have available virtually um, even when we're able to do it in person there's a couple of reasons for that um, one um, in person we are limited um, by how many kids can be in the room we know that large class sizes don't really work and that's the same with a, a large program size for a program like Ready, Set, School, the learning is just not going to be as um, transformative. So, um, but also a lot of families don't necessarily have schedules that line up with when library programs are. Um, so if we have something virtually, then they can watch it on their own schedule. Um, the great thing about uh, doing something virtually is um, I have to have an in-person program. I mean, I, the library, you know, we have to have in-person programs at different libraries and people have to drive to it. So you want to have things close by family members, but virtually we only have to have one virtual program um, and anybody can access that. So kind of understanding some of those things will help you make those decisions. Of course, it all comes down to what you're able to sustain. And that might be something that you are, if you are able to articulate this and someone says well we want you to keep doing online book clubs if you understand why you do them then it gives you the ability to say hey um, we understand that we just don't have the staff to sustain that and the reason we do our book clubs is to create this community 
of readers. And so our book club is really about helping people come together and meet each other. And so we're going to put our focus on that rather than doing it virtually where people don't get to meet each other. Or you could say our book clubs are for older um, um, community members and online is just harder for them. And so we're going to um, do it in person. Whatever the answer is, um, if you really thought about it, then you can be um, intentional about your decision making. Great, that that's really helpful. Um, does your system plan to go out and ask for additional resources for continuing virtual programming? Uh, maybe, I don't know. We, <laughs> well, like most of you, um, we're still kind of just dealing with what's going on day to day. So that's where most of our focus is, is how are, <laughs> how are we just getting through right now? Um, but I can say since I, with the why, if I needed extra resources for ready, a virtual Ready Set School um, or some other program that we do in the next few months, because you know we're not going back to in person anytime soon. Um, I will have the kind of you know I will have the reason um, to and the justification for those resources if I need additional resources. Um, so that's what's that's why I really emphasize understanding your why, um, because then you'll know what you need. Um, we have another great question on how did you let parents in the community know that you were moving to online programming and that it was coming? Um, so we did it um, through um, one, like I said, we already had a pretty robust Facebook presence. So um, we put out information through that. Um, we also were able to um, use our um, email list. So we have uh, uh, the ability um, to email the parents of children. So we send out an email. Um, we also did um, some, boy, it feels like a billion years ago when we started it, um, a press release. We put information on our website. Um, and then a, um, uh, we did get some news coverage um, from, um, the Arizona Daily Star and website, This is Tucson, um, who picked up those virtual programs, you know, because they were trying to cover what's happening virtually um, for families um, at the beginning of the pandemic. So um, kind of through like some of the normal means um, as, as well as um, virtually. Um, Great. Yes. Oh, I'll just add one thing that I'm um, thinking about those. Um, one thing that was interesting is we had pretty high um, engagement. I mean, we still actually have very high engagement with those um, um, Facebook videos. Um, so when we started it, um, we would have, you know, 10, 15 families watching at a time, which is interesting because that's about the same as our in-person. Um, but that the um, number of hits on those videos just is huge so some of them it's up to 900 more plus views um and we also offer this in english and spanish um but what was interesting is when school started back up that was kind of through the summer when school started back up um our people viewing live went way down i'm sure because um of school um and there's just so much um you know probably internet um access for families. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but what hasn't gone down is the views after. So we don't have as many people watching live, um, but there's still about the same amount um, watching, um, you know, whenever it works for them. And that leads into another question we received, which is um, somebody would like to know if you can give more information about how long you keep up the videos on your site, like do, you, do they remain there? Do they, they is there a, a life um, for those? And and how did you view the counting of attendance um, yeah. on those? And, and because that's a different, you know, that, that looks different, right? And then how yeah. did you also handle permissions for reading on a public site? Yeah, um, so we were, um, they are not archived forever, um, and that's because of the um, permissions from publishers. So we made sure that whatever books we're choosing um, fit the variety of permissions by the publishers, um, and we post that in, you know, 
in the comments we say this book is read been permission from blah 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 publisher whatever um we're following that um they can't be archived for forever because of those publisher permissions so we kind of leave it up um at least through the session but i think there's a couple of sessions up um and um i haven't gone back to look and see which ones have been taken down but um we've had a couple of different sessions um so there's always at least one full session up and it repeats so um and yeah the, the permissions are an issue so we make sure i mean there yeah it's sometimes you have to really spend a fair amount of time finding a book by a publisher that's given permissions that are um loose enough for us to read it online um on facebook live so um that is one of the considerations and you have to really think about that um there's another part of that question but i forgot the end part it was on the attendance and how you viewed the differences um when you went to virtual yeah so that's also in flux so for um i report um out for our stats um the number of people watching live because we're we're thinking of it as a live program um because that is really the intent of it um which is annoying to me personally because there's so many views afterward but it can be hard um to gather those views and to know when do you when do you report on a, a view because of course the numbers just keep going up um so um it, it, there's some guidelines and i just i follow the guidelines um given to me um by um our data librarian um sandy so i follow what she says which um was also coming from the state library what they want reported and then um um project outcome has um a a new um way of recording things and um, suggestions. So I think some of it is also just gonna be a, a discussion with your administration about what stats they want gathered. And um, we have one more question about your checklist that came in and mm -hmm. um, wanting a little bit more information about the last bullet point in that checklist about checking oh. with the CEO. Um, oh, that's oh. the community engagement office um and so that's if you're um if you're like doing a zoom um program do you do you have have you gotten everything has it got set up properly so that's what that is so um my i'm part of the community engagement office and we're kind of um um thinking about those programs for children teens adults um our different audiences in the community and like I said, I'm happy to share all of this stuff. And a lot of what we've put together has come from other libraries. So we looked around for other libraries, other, I emailed stuff, um, other libraries to ask what they were doing. They shared stuff with us. Um, so yeah, we, it's not like we didn't, we didn't build this wheel. We just modified it for our personal needs. Um, but I'm happy to share this. Wonderful. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> And um, in order to stand on your shoulders, we did have a request that um, would it be possible for you, you're, you're planning to share these slides, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would it be possible to put a link in the slides um, that link to the sessions that um, so others can see what you have online right now? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I forgot to do that. Um, yeah, or you can just go to Pima County Public Library's Facebook page and click on videos. Um, and you can see what's there, um, but okay. I'll put a link in. But yeah, it's open. Anybody can look at it. Okay, wonderful. Um, and any, um, I'm sorry, we went, we had so many questions. We are not going to be able to um, get to them all. So um, Kendra did leave her contact information. So please be sure to reach out with any other questions. Um, do you have any last minute thoughts before we uh, wrap up here? I don't. I just I. Thank you all for taking the time to um, serve your community and figure out how you can do that effectively. And yeah, if you have a question that you want answered, um, send me an email.
<laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all for being with us today. And thank you to the Library Arizona Library Association and to Literacy Connects for sponsoring today's webinar. Thanks.